Okay, hello everybody. My name is Michael and I'm talking about boot time optimization for the real world. So perhaps um, first a few words about myself. Um, I've been working for Pengotronics now for over a decade and doing mostly Linux, embedded Linux consulting and uh, development, these kind of things. And this also includes quite a few boot time optimization projects over the years. So let's get started. First, uh, my motivation for this talk in general. I was at the ELC last year and there were two talks about boot time optimization actually that year. And one of them was uh, we need to talk about uh, systemd, boot time optimization for the new init daemon. This is, was basically uh, introductory for um, um, introductory presentation, mostly for beginners. So I wasn't exactly the uh, um, target audience, but it was a nice start. And the other one was um, time boot time reduction techniques. And this was actually quite interesting, had a few nice techniques and a rather impressive result. But at the end of the talk, I was sitting there think, thinking, well, this is not actually something that I can use this way in my project because um, there were many compromises made, many choices to reduce the boot time, but in, in many cases at the cost of other, let's say, secondary functionality. And uh, this is, it's often the case for me at least that, that boot time is important, but there are many other topics that are even more important or at least as important. So focusing only on boot time was a bit limited for me. So I want to talk about a bit about more the, the overall situation there when, when optimizing and looking at ways to not just optimize, optimize, optimize for boot time, but say, thinking, well, I can do this, but maybe I shouldn't because I sacrifice this feature or how can I improve the boot time, but um, without sacrificing um, either features in my system. Okay, so before we start with the actual um, topics, I want to think a bit about why do we do boot time optimizations? Because this usually brings us to what are we optimizing for? What are the actual requirements um, we have to boot faster? So um, the first part is that when we do optimizations, there are what I call hard requirements. This basically means that um, there are situations where um, there is a, from a specification or things like that, from hardware requirements, it says, okay, when a device is powered on, then after half a second or one second, the device must respond to an outside request or must send some message. This is typically um, in the automotive industry, there's, there are cases like that where um, I'll, I'll get to that later a bit in, in an example. Um, but this, these are hard requirements. So this means we must hit the deadline. There is no flexibility there. And then there are the what I call soft requirements where it's mostly about user experience. So you switch on a device and if you start thinking, hmm, maybe switching on didn't work because there is no reaction to your action, then there is some optimization to be done here. Or if um, later on, this is usually a, a bit a longer time um, available there that you switch the device on and then you're getting annoyed because it takes too long to start before you can actually use the device. These are the kind of more um, flexible requirements because there is no fixed deadline that says, okay, after 500 milliseconds, we have to show something on the screen or things like that. But more a, um, there is a reaction to what I do and we have more um, flexibility to, to um, solve the issue when it comes to maybe let's do 
something specific, show something on the screen or whatever to um, keep the to keep the user um, entertained, for example. Okay, so whenever you do optimizations, when we get started here, it's important to choose a target what you want to optimize because that's what you need to measure. So you need to decide there's no, I want to boot in five seconds because what does it mean to boot in five seconds? There is no, if you don't specify what has to happen before the, end, the five seconds are over. So the first step is always pick what is optimized. What are we optimizing for? So this can be, especially for example, for the, um, for hard requirement, there can, this can be that we have to send a can message after 500 milliseconds or after a second. This can be one requirement. Or, um, I talked a bit about reaction, um, to power on. So we want to show something on the screen, anything just to show the user powering on the device actually did something, switched, it. pressing a button actually caused something to happen. And then there might be another, if we're going further along in the timeline, there may be the, the point where um, the first user interaction is possible. So for example, um, we can log in if there is a, a login screen. Um, or um, things like that, or I have the first view that shows me initial information. And then there is usually, it can be later in, in many cases that the full interaction is, is possible. So that the device is fully working and all features are accessible. Okay, so, and what I started with was, I want to not just look at boot times, but also at what is, what are other requirements that I have other things in the system. Usually it's not directly features for the device, the primary features, but more things like, well, we still need to debug the device in the field because this is a complex machinery and bugs are often not reproducible in the lab. So we want to be able to do minimal debugging in the field. That's also something. Um, what might be interesting or necessary. Or well, let's talk about robustness. Um, maybe if an application crashes, we want it should be restarted. And here, that's why I wrote it at the side, I'm only talking about systems with, that are starting with systemd because systemd provides me with a lot of features just for that, monitoring if an application is actually still working properly, restarting it um, when, uh, uh, when it crashes things like that. Or let's talk about the next topic, security. That's always important and often conflicts with, uh, with uh, boot time optimization because um, it can slow things down. It's, and, and system they provides me with features that I can easily enable to um, isolate individual applications, these kind of things. And then there's development and testing. In many cases, um, there are recommendations to disable all kinds of things for boot time optimization. But at the end, the device is no longer debuggable. So what happens is that the developers use a different setup than the final release because they can no longer debug the final release. And at that point, the testing with the final release is reduced because the developers no longer or let test less with the final version. And this means we have to do more testing if we have a different setup for development as we have for release. This is something to take, to take into account. Um, because that's always a money question as well, because we have to spend more time on extra testing to keep up, um, with the quality here. And then there is maintenance. If we add a lot of ugly hacks to boot faster, and then we need to do a system update, then we have to port all those hacks. This is, can be a lot of effort because we spend a lot of time in the first iteration to, 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 do, boot, to do the boot time optimization. And then we have to do it again, basically, because it was just hacks that we piled on top of the old version. 
So what are we looking at? Well, there's just the typical thing that's disable everything. Well, most things. I'm not looking at that today because, well, there are a lot of um, presentations out there that do that for us. Um, so what can we do? We can delay things. So instead of just disabling all the features, let's look at ways to do it later after our initial um, target for um, optimizations um, reached. Or, well, my most, um, the thing what I prefer most in most cases is to actually optimize the code, look at things and say, hey, this is slow. And instead of disabling, thinking, well, why is this slow at startup? Can we improve here and still keep the feature? It may not give us as much, much optimization as disabling the feature, um, but it will probably give us something. And the best part about this is it's not just for one project. It's something we, if it's contributed upstream especially, it's something that we can and others can profit from um, when the next project comes around. And then it's cheating. I mean, especially in the um, case for uh, the, with the user interaction, presenting the user, something to the user often distracts them from realizing that the device is actually not finished booting. For example, I have this old phone. If I switch it on, I get the screen to, to enter my uh, PIN, and then I'm in this regular menu, and I can call a number. But what I cannot do for quite some time, actually, is open the address book. And actually, I didn't notice that for over a year, since, um, after I got this the phone, to, to, to realize that that was what's happening. And I think that's the actual, the, the most important point, because we can put something in somewhere and, and leave things out and delay them because they're not actually needed to get these, let's say, soft requirements resolved. Let's get to some real things. The serial console. This is something where most people, when they start with, um, with uh, boot time optimization, say, that's a bit quiet. The background here is, of course, output on the serial console, especially from the kernel, is very slow. So it can easily add a few hundred milliseconds. And user space is not quite as bad, but it's still there. So, but what I'm, I'm proposing is not, don't use quiet, because quiet disables all oral errors as well. There is lock level equals five. This means we only show warnings and worse. And quite frankly, in the final product, there should be no warnings. So we have no output until an error occurs. And so this is a setting one can keep during development because the error is still visible when something happens during development. And the same thing we can do for the user space startup because system D has options for that as well. System D lock level warning, same thing, only print warnings or higher. And then there's the system D show status. If we set it to auto, it will not print the typical system D messages, you know, the ones with the green OK that comes scrolling by at the beginning. They're not visible unless an error occurs. And in that, at that moment, system D switches to the other mode and prints all the following messages that come at that point. So again, if no error occurs, we have no output. So basically, you have the same effect as quiet, but only in the good case, only in when there is no error. And that means we can keep this active during development. So we don't have a different setup for development. Well, and then when we're in user space, there's UDEF. UDEF call plug, basically, for those who don't know what it means, is it looks at all the devices in the system that are already there and basically announces to the user space this device is available for use. So this is necessary in general because, well, we don't know if a hardware is actually accessible right from the beginning. Let's, for example, USB devices take some time to be initialized, which means 
that if you try to access, for example, a USB stick, a USB mass storage device, too early, it's not actually there yet. So UDEF handles that for you, but the problem is this takes a long time. Iterating over all existing devices in the, in the system, doing stuff with them, enumerating data about them, about them, it takes time. So in general, we want to avoid dependencies like that, which is sometimes a bit tricky because, well, let's take an example. The root file system is mounted read-only for robustness. So we need a data partition to save our configuration, for example, our error data. This is another device that needs to be mounted and has, a in general, a dependency on, well, UDIF. Well, what can we do to avoid that? Well, there is the first um, version is use auto mounts. Auto mounts means um, the file system is auto mounted automatically in the background, either already starting to do that or triggered by an access to actual file on the file system, which means we can start the application right at the beginning and as soon as the application tries to access a file on the file system, this will block until the file system is mounted. So we can do the application startup and the UDEF code plug and the mounting of the file system in parallel. Saves this boot time. The other version is to trick system. Um, this has a, a few requirements. In general, let's say we have a EMMC and there is a partition for the root file system and a partition for the data. And they're on the same device, which means we know that if the root file system is mounted, then the data partition is always available. So in this specific case, we do not need to wait for the device to appear because it's guaranteed to be there already. And while systemd in general tries to do the generic thing, so it will always add the dependency. But, well, if we fake, uh, we try, if we, we, we trick systemd into believing that there is no actual device behind the file system. For example, um, there are some file systems that don't have a device, like uh, a bind mounts, for example, mounts, um, where we don't need a specific device, but just the source directory there. Um, or uh, there are other things as well. And if systemd doesn't know that there's a device, it will not add a dependency for the device. And you have two ways to trick that. One is to write a manual um, systemd mount unit and write what equals CUID equals file system UID in there. It's not a path anymore, not a, a device in the file system, in, in the device file system anymore. And now systemd doesn't know that there's a device behind it, so that will not add a dependency. The other way is we actually use a symlink outside of slash dev and use that as a device. Also, systemd will check, is my source for mounting a device? And if yes, I'll add a dependency. If it's outside slash dev, systemd thinks it's not a device, so it will not add a dependency. The trick thing is we need to do things like FS check manually. So systemd doesn't know it's a device, so it will not add a file system check for it. So we do need to do that manually. So let's look at a small example to get an, a feeling for how that works, what it helps. I did, did a small example. It's a, uh, a small Qt QML application. It does some basic setup and then reads the file from the file system, basically faking I'm reading my configuration. And then it loads the QML, basically loads the UI, um, shows the window and says, hey, yeah, now I'm, I'm ready. Well, let's compare it. I've done this on the STM32 MP1. Um, this is a rather slow um, CPU. I use this because it um, gives me relatively large numbers to work with. So I'm, I can show the effect quite, quite nicely. Um, it's a dual core, Cortex A7, 800 megabytes, so really not, nothing very fast. 
And I've used the eMMC as mass storage. So in, in the beginning, I mean, it was basically with very little other um, boot time optimizations. We're starting at eight seconds from kernel startup. Um, so then I tried, and, and this gave me the eight seconds. That's my baseline. So with the auto mount, I got 7.4 seconds. With the fake device, so I'm a trick system D, um, that's 6.7 seconds. And I can, of course, mix the two, right? I can do a fake mount, the fake device, and still doing, for example, the FS check in parallel to the application startup by using auto mount. But in this case, the same was, time was actually the same because probably on the dual core device, um, it didn't actually help anything from, because it wasn't, I don't know, I didn't look into details, but, but conceptually, probably, um, the scheduling overhead there uh, was worse than what I was gaining, things like that. And it really depends on the use case. For example, if the application is, is loading, um, the file later, reading data later, doing more initialization at the beginning, um, this can have an impact. Or if there are more than two cores, um, the cold plug is faster with more cores, cores. It, it, it scales, it, par it paralyzes quite well in many, in, 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 in uh, many cases. So the cold plug is faster with more cores while an application startup typically is single threaded. So there's just one core used for that. So, um, it really depends on, on, uh, on the use case if one or the other or both um, of, the, of the techniques help here. Um, auto mount has to make this is easier. Well, there's not a lot to do, but simply saying in the uh, a comment, basically uh, in the FS tab and that's it. While for the, for the other case, we had to need to add the sim link or we need to write a full um, unit file and we need to handle the FS check manual, these kind of things. Okay. What's next? So cold plug is used for more than just saying there's a device. It also do, does some initialization. For example, it can do um, changing the, can change the, the ownership, which when we look at security is important that for example, a device is actually accessible by the application. Um, and so, if you want to do that, and the application does not, is not running as root, which it hopefully doesn't. And then we need to wait for UDEF to change the ownership and uh, the group of the device file. We could do this manually, of course, but then we adding extra stuff or in there need to implement things ourselves. So it's something that I'd like to avoid. And of course, the changing the ownership is only a very small part, something, something simple. There are more complex things that you can do with UDEF. So, and what you can do here is split the UDEF. UDEF, this code plug is this UDEF admin trigger, which enumerates the existing devices. And what you can do here is say, well, I don't want to trigger all devices, but maybe in my case, it's for example, only the DRM devices, the graphics devices. So we're reducing the load for the cold plug to make it run faster because we don't have a lot of um, ways to actually order which device comes first. So if we reduce the amount of devices to only those that we actually need at boot time, we can make this part faster. And then when the application is then starting, we can do the other half, all other devices. And we did still do the cold plug. It's, we still have a full setup of our, of our system, but we've just split it in parts. And one is run when we need it at, uh, during the hot path. And the rest is run after the application. And it doesn't really matter when it's running here. So this gives us a way to, yeah, um, delay a lot of device initializations. It can actually be used if you don't do the UDEF, it's not written that down here, but if you don't do the UDEF for a certain group of devices, 
this may mean, for example, that um, they're not loading the modules for it, possibly. Um, I'm not sure if that's right. Maybe not. But you're not initializing the, the devices for the user space. You can, um, you can delay things until they're actually needed. Maybe not at all, or maybe only for development or for maintenance, these kind of things. Okay, so let's say, well, we don't need any devices here or only devices that are already there. And waiting for the initial setup with systemd is too slow before we actually want to show something on the screen. Then we can do a boot splash. Um, with an application, with a very simple application. It runs as PID1, so we're executing it instead of systemd. And, well, it just shows a static image on the screen. And then it forks. And one application, just the, the, the child, just stays there in the background because if you use DRM and the application exits, well, then the device is closed, the content is lost, the display goes, up, um, goes off again. So we don't want to do that, so it stays around. But it does release a DRM master. This basically means if another application comes later and opens the DRM device as well, it is actually allowed to do that and to provide new content for the screen. Then at that point, we can kill the application because another new application has taken over the screen. So, and the PID1, after forking the child, will simply execute systemd. This is a relatively easy way to provide something on the screen and we can get usually order of magnitude about one second after power on this is manageable in many cases. It depends really on the hardware, but that's about the order of magnitude, what you can reach with that, maybe a bit faster, maybe a bit slower. And in many cases, I've, I've often done boot time optimization and say, okay, here, and we do this and we have ideas and well, why don't we put here a boot screen to get something on the screen and then we can optimize the rest, but we have a bit more and then say, hey, boot screen, well, screen, something on the screen after one second, ready, great, we're done. We don't need anything more. Because in many cases, that's actually the biggest concern is your power on the device and the device does nothing. And there a boot screen really helps. Right. Um, but sometimes it doesn't because we actually need to do something early. And but now it gets complicated. I try to avoid this because writing applications to run early requires a lot more attention to the details. You need to know what's available, what's not. There's no temporary file system available at that point. You may need to mount some file system, the procfs or sysfs or things like that explicitly manually because they're not available at that point. So this makes things a lot more complex. And I'd like to avoid that um, to, to allow application developers just to write the normal applications. But sometimes it's necessary. And then we don't have a boot splash application, but a regular application that's actually doing more than just dump something on the screen and then wait. And again, we fork, hit one, start systemd, and the other one runs in parallel. The problem with that is that when we do that, we cannot, um, we can no longer use a lot of the features from systemd because this application runs out of the outside of scope of systemd where systemd tracks the applications. So no research, no resource limits, all these kinds of things are not available. We can improve things a bit, however. Um, I mean, for services and things like that, systemd uses C groups. And moving applications or processes from one C group to another is possible. You need to correct uh, permissions, so we need to take care of that. But in general, you can import this running application into a service later on. That's possible. However, it only it's only part of the deal, right? We can now track if the application exits and if we do things right with telling systemd this is the new new um, actual the pit of this app, if this still running, already running application is actually the main pit. So this is the main process we can track. Yes, this 
service has failed because the application exited. We can do that. Um, we can actually do things like watchdog because this um, SD Notify socket that's used to do this watchdog pinging to systemd, um, we can pass that socket to another application. But it requires work and it's only half the deal because things like um, resource limits, other restricted access, the security features basically, they're not available because the setup for that happens before the app application is forked by systemd, uh, before it exits. So it's systemd forks, sets up the, the limits, and then exits the actual process. That's not possible when we import the, the process. What we can also do, instead of importing, we can restart it basically. But that means, while well, there's a running application, a new one starts, and we need to transfer the state from one application to the other, it's possible, but it's all a lot of work. So I try to avoid that when possible, but it's a way to get the best of both worlds. I know there are um, the proponents that say, well, if you really want to boot fast, you need to run it, um, your application as PID1. Well, here's a way to mix that with, with some work to get most or, or almost all features from systemd as well, all the additional stuff we have. And if you do it right, you can actually um, test both ways. Basically, you can restart the application normal as a service and you can do the, the importing and these kind of things. There are ways to, uh, to test that a bit, but um, it gives you a lot more features and mixing uh, basically uh, the two ways and, and still have fast booting and all the features. And actually, if you put a lot of work in it, for both of the cases, both the uh, splash and the application, you can do that in an init RV, in an RamFS. It saves a little more time possibly because you don't need to mount the root file system. It really depends on your device. If you have a, a root file system that where the device is detected very fast and mounting is very fast, then you don't save a lot. But if mounting the root file system takes a lot of time comparatively, then an init RD can be used to start the application. But, it, but this means even more work. You don't just have to access systemd and do more things later on, but you have to first mount the root file system, do the change root kind of things, and then exec system, um, um, fork and exec systemd. So there are ways to mix all these kind of features, but every step is a bit more work. Right, debugging. Um, this is actually interesting because uh, at some point, some a while ago, a colleague came and oh, I want to debug. Here's an issue. I want to, what should I do? And a, another colleague says, "Hey, use um, function tracer to to see what's actually happening in the kernel." I said, "Yeah, hmm, function tracer. There's nothing there. This this file in debugfs where I should write something in there is not there." When she realized, well. Yeah, it wasn't there because the kernel was boot time optimized and the tracing was disabled. In this specific case, um, enabling the tracing infrastructure is, was not a lot of work. I mean, that's just bored on our development desks. But if we are talking about, I, I talked a bit at the beginning about um, debugging in the field, then that's a whole different cable game. So I'd like to keep debugging features, but the tracing is at this point, well, these are the numbers from the same example, from the same hardware I had before for the other example. So out of the eight seconds originally for boot, 1.4 seconds were from kernel start until root file system is mounted. And out of that 1.4 seconds, 0.9 seconds, so two thirds basically were just some initialization for core tracing. It's not just function tracers, but there are other tracers, but basically that's some core tracing infrastructure that is needed by multiple features in the kernel. And that's yeah, enabled by multiple features if you, if you switch them on in the kernel config. So, well, 0.9 seconds is a lot. So, well, should we disable it? Probably right now is the only way if you really need that. 
But I did spend a little time of looking what's actually going on there. And I noticed in the end, so I'm not really a kernel developer. I know my way around it a bit and I've done a bit of kernel development, but mostly I'm a user space guy. But from what it looks like to me, there is some function that's called initially for the kernel, basically all the code that's already there. And later on, the same function is called for each module that is loaded. To me, that sounds like it's probably something we can delay as well for the kernel part. We don't need to do it immediately because we're doing later stuff later for the modules as well. So it's probably something, maybe something we can delay until we actually do some kind of tracing. Now I know we can do enable tracing via the kernel command line. So in that case, it has to be started immediately. But in the production system on a real hardware in the, in the field, we don't enable tracing on the kernel command line. So my hope is we can actually remove those 900 milliseconds or a lot of those 900 milliseconds and do that sometime later. I've not done that yet, or rather, I have not had the chance to ask a colleague to do it for me because there's other kernel hackers. Because while I was preparing a presentation for a conference, and this is not a customer project where I have a bit more of a budget to spend uh, to do, do something with development. But my hope is here to actually eventually get rid of those 900 milliseconds in this hardware. It's faster on other hardware to be able to keep the tracing infrastructure enabled without the penalty, the big penalty. Well, yeah, let's see, patch opportunities. Maybe someone else finds some time to look at that now that I've pointed it out and we'll get that fixed. <laughs> and then next few kernel workers, maybe. Let's see, maybe the next time I get the bootcamp optimization project on my desk, I can say, hey, here, I know there's some optimization possibilities and we'll get someone to do it. And then another interesting topic is security. I mean, for me, my perspective for boot time optimization is usually, I provide the platform, right? Provide the Linux kernel, the basic user space libraries, LibC, systemd, and my customers, they're writing the actual application to that as the real things, the important things. So when I do boot time optimizations, one of the biggest problems I have is that there is one application, in many cases, there's one application, there's a black box for me, basically. And when I ask the customer, often doesn't actually know what the requirements actually are. So which devices are used? What other dependencies in my system do I have? Which file systems will be accessed? So it's one big black box for me and it makes it really hard to optimize because exactly the kind of things that I propose to move things later, I can only do that if I know they're not used, that I know they're not needed to start this application. And that's where, where security comes in. Because with real good security concept, you split your application. There's not one single monolithic application, but you do multiple processes to make uh, privilege separation possible. So you have one process that is only for the UI mainly. And then maybe a control process in the back and another process that has communication to the outside, these kind of things. And the interfaces are clearly defined because if it's not specified, it's not allowed to access something. So if there is some hardware that can be accessed, it will get a permission denied because we didn't specify that it's allowed to access this hardware. So we have split and uh, split into multi applications. We have clear definitions on what's actually needed. And that helps actually a lot to do boot time optimizations because all this information I can use to do my ordering. And that's something I can communicate where I can communicate with the customer because in many cases where we don't know what we need and what we use, but hey, does it matter? The application is running, it started. We've already done this, working on this project for half a year and it was no problem. Why don't you do your boot time optimizations and let us work on our application? So, and with security, 
there is all this information available because someone needs to say, okay, here, access to this hardware is allowed, which means this hardware is needed. So there is opportunities here, but there are off, of course, um, also downsides. I mean, security has a penalty always. There is always some overhead when you enable some feature. Um, I mean, we've seen that with all the hardware uh, vulnerabilities, how much overhead security in these cases can be. And if you enable features like SecComp, which system provides, which basically means that for every system call you do, we check if it's allowed to be called, that check costs. So, and it slows down startup time as well. So um, there is an overhead, but there are also opportunities because we can mix the effort to do boot time optimization with the effort to do security. And one last thing I want to talk about is hardware. I mean, in general, you say premature optimization and these kind of things, right? Well, I'm saying if you want to boot fast, you better think about that when you design your hardware. Because the wrongly designed hardware is always a problem because that's not something you can fix in software. Most important thing is use fast mass storage. Really, really important because at the end of the day, you're loading a lot of code, you're loading a lot of data from the device. If the device runs twice as fast, it takes half the time. Of course, you can try to load less, but still, if it's faster to load, it's still faster to run. And then there is USB. USB from the specification has certain timeouts. So it takes some time before a device is available. If we need that device at boot time, that's not something we can reduce, right? We can rid of the timeout. There's actually a good example from the one boot time optimization talk, talk from last time, last year, because it basically was a USB camera and the content was sent to the screen. And I think at the end of, at the end of all optimizations, half the time was spent on waiting for the USB camera to be available. And I mean, that's frustrating, right? You're doing all these kind of, this kind of good work to get the software fast. And then you have this hardware limitation that basically says, here's my data, hard limit. Doesn't get better. And there are other ways, for example, with cameras, there are on system on chips, camera interfaces where you can use a camera that's actually fast to start. And all these kind of things. So think about what you want to do when you design your hardware. When you say, I want, I need to boot fast, I need to boot within a certain limit, then I need to think about it with my hardware. FPGAs is another issue here. If you load an FPGA bitstream, sometimes you have a very slow interface. And if you take a half a second or a second to load the bitstream from the bootloader, that's a second that you cannot optimize away if your design is that way. So think about these kind of things when designing your hardware. You cannot do everything perfectly there, right? But you can avoid the biggest issues. Well, that's it from my side. So I'm up for questions now.